Hello class, today we're going to talk about position time and velocity time graphs. These are two very useful ways for us to look at some things we've already been talking about. We'll be able to identify position, distance, velocity, and see how it all relates to time. Some of the things I'm going to do in this screencast might take a few extra minutes to sink in. Don't forget you can always stop and go back or pause it if you need a little bit more time. The goal for today is to look at position versus time graphs. Then we'll look at velocity versus time graphs. From there, we'll see how you can go from a position time to a velocity time and back. We're going to start with a little example here. We've got a squirrel. We've got a tree. We're going to say that the tree is the origin. I get to pick the origin. This is just convenient for us. I've got my squirrel right now that is located at a position of two meters. Remember that position is the separation between the object and the origin. Position is what we will often graph. It's important to note that it can be negative. Sometimes you will see me go from position to distance. Understand that they are very similar things. Distance is the separation between an object and another point, another reference point. However, Position is always referenced against the origin. Here we are, little squirrels at two meters, getting ready for winter. You'll notice the time up in the top right corner. Squirrels moving out away from the origin, picks up the acorn, goes back to the tree, sees the glory at the other end. This is our first look at a position versus time graph. This is for the squirrel. So the black line indicates where the squirrel is actually located. Remember, our squirrel was moving in one dimension, so it was either moving away from the tree or towards the tree. So the only thing we can tell from this graph is what the squirrel's position was as a function of time. Started at two meters. At about one second, the squirrel decided to move. It continued moving at a constant velocity until it got to five meters. Sat there for a little bit, picking up that acorn. Then it went back towards the origin, back towards the tree took some time to get there. Stopped for one second, turned around, went back up to the five meters at a particular velocity, and then it looks like it slowed down a little bit as it continued to the glory. If I wanted to see the position versus time graph for the acorn, the one that actually moved, we could look at it here. Remember, it started at position five meters, and it sat there until it was picked up by the squirrel. Then it tracks the same line that the squirrel did until it gets to the tree where it stays stationary for the remainder of the time. Let's take a look at position time graphs a little bit closer. I'm going to just take this arbitrary graph and I'm going to say that we want to look at these two different positions. The first one I can identify as being di, that's a position, but I'm going to use d as a distance here so that it's consistent with some of our future equations. So I have an initial distance. I also have an initial time. I can tag the other spot with a final distance and a final time. I'm doing this because I want to recall that slope is equal to rise over run. If I want the slope for this particular graph, I'll identify that the rise is df minus di, which is delta d. If I want to know what is the run, how much did I go to the right, that is tf minus ti or delta t. If I take the rise over run, I get delta d over delta t, which we already know is defined as velocity. So notice this connection here. The slope of a position time graph is equal to the velocity of the object. This is a very key idea that actually comes out of calculus that we need to remember. Let's go back to our position versus time graph for the squirrel. I'm going to go ahead and just show you the entire velocity versus time graph, and then we're going to figure out how to break it down step by step. This is velocity on the left, on the vertical axis, as a function of time. You can see that I only have vertical or horizontal lines. I am implying that when the little squirrel is traveling, it travels at a constant velocity. I'm drawing a vertical line just to aid our eye on the path of the curve here. Notice also I've lightly highlighted the horizontal axis. It's not 
any longer at the very bottom of the screen. We actually dip into negative numbers for a brief time. It's much easier to see what's going on if you have the position time and velocity time graphs together on the same sheet. So I'm going to go ahead and do that here. You see the position time up top, the velocity time on bottom. The time should line up fairly well. We're going to look at this one little bit at a time. If we look at this first little highlighted region, we see that on the position time graph, the squirrel does not actually move from zero seconds to one second. That implies that there is no velocity, no movement. Also, I can say the slope of a horizontal line is zero, so the velocity should be zero. If I go to the next one here, my squirrel is moving. It's moving in the positive direction. It goes from two meters to five meters, and it does that in five seconds time. So that's three meters divided by five seconds is 0.6 meters per second. You can see on the velocity time graph that we are at 0.6 meters per second. After that, the squirrel stays stationary for one second. Again, I have a slope of zero, so my velocity must go back down to zero. On this one, this is interesting. You need to make sure you see that the squirrel is going back towards the tree. The squirrel goes from position five to position zero. Remember, delta D is always final minus initial. So my final position for this segment is zero minus my initial position was five. So zero minus five is negative five. Divided by the amount of time that it took to go from, from this, which looks like seven seconds to to 12 seconds. So that's a five second interval. So I had negative five meters divided by five seconds is negative one meters per second. Then I have another region where the squirrel is stationary. I have a region now where the squirrel is traveling again. The squirrel is traveling at its fastest speed at this particular one. The squirrel is able to cover five meters in three seconds on this plot. At that point, the squirrel slows down a little bit. This time it's covered five meters in five seconds. And then once the squirrel is at the pile of acorns, then it stops for one additional second, which is where we end. Remember, for every segment that we looked at on these particular graphs, all I was doing is I was taking the slope of the position time graph on top. That is the rise, the change in position, divided by the run, which was the change in time. I take that slope and that tells me the velocity. If my position is measured in meters and my time in seconds, like it is on this graph, then my velocity must come out in meters per second. Let's turn our attention to an arbitrary velocity versus time graph and see what information we can get out of it. I'm gonna identify this red rectangle. This rectangle has a height v for velocity. The base of the rectangle is from t initial to t final. We can say that that is actually a delta t, t final minus t initial to get us the actual quantity for that base. This is useful because we want to find the area of it. The area of a rectangle is base times height. As we just mentioned, my base is actually delta t going to multiply that by the height, which we said was V, that's going to give us delta D. That, if you look at it, is just a variation of our equation that says V is equal to delta D over delta T. Notice that the area of the rectangle is equal to delta T, according to these relationships. I've highlighted two very important points about this. First, the height that you're using for your rectangle is defined as the velocity relative to the axis, and it can be negative. If it is underneath the axis, then you are going to use a negative velocity for the height that will get multiplied in, and ultimately you'll end up with a negative area. Also, don't forget that delta D is a change in position. So it doesn't tell you where you're going to be located. It tells you how much your position will change over that time interval. Let's have a look at our old squirrel graphs here. I've highlighted a region in red. It's a particular area that I want to look at. 
Let's calculate the area. I can find the area is the, I'm showing the height first is one meter per second times the base is five seconds. That gives me a total area of five meters. That tells me what my position must change by in that time interval. So trace up back to the position time. And you'll see that from that initial time, I must go up five meters, positive five meters. Let's look at a different region. Because the velocity is zero, I don't actually have any area. So by that rationale, I cannot have any change in position. So I must stay at five meters. Let's now look at this particular region. You can see that the squirrel gets closer to the tree according to the position time graph. That means that the squirrel must have a negative velocity, which is indicated on our velocity time plot. We're going to highlight this particular area. It is a negative one meters per second times five seconds to get the area, which comes out to a, an area of negative five meters. That means the position must change by negative five. And the squirrel did indeed go from five meters down to zero meters. It's important to recognize that you shouldn't feel like you have to bracket off regions that are nicely defined by simple rectangles. We can look at this entire region, for example. I can identify these three areas that are going to make up the what we call the area under the curve. Now I've identified for that middle one, that's the only area we haven't calculated yet, this area is 1.6 repeated times 3 seconds, which also happens to come out to positive 5. From previous calculations, we know that first rectangle was negative 5, and the one on the far right was positive 5. If I look at the total area for all of these rectangles, I get a total area of plus 5 meters. You see that my negative 5 cancels out one of the positive 5s, and I find a total area of plus 5. That means from the initial time, where the squirrel was at 5 meters at 7 seconds, by the time I get to the end of this time interval, clear out to 22 seconds, the squirrel must have traveled an additional plus 5 meters. Let's recap what we have here. You can use the slope on a position time graph to determine the average velocity of the object. Also, you can use what we call the area under the curve on a velocity time graph to determine the change in position of an object. Remember, you can always go back and look at the video again, and I encourage you to try to calculate some of the areas and slopes yourself. But for now, if you think you got everything, let your computer know.